Good morning. What's up, you guys? You guys having a good Hall of Fame? Yeah. All right, me too. I'm having a lot of fun. And uh, this morning is going to be extra fun because, uh, you know, I get to introduce you to some really awesome people who not that long ago uh, sat in those same chairs that you guys are sitting in. So uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce uh, 2020 grad Kyle Doobie. There he is. Hey, everybody. Hello. Next, I uh, say good morning to 2021 grad Mickey Potter. <laughs> and finally, the uh, elder statesman of the group. That's uh, going to be 2019 grad Isabel Machado. And so, um, you know, in all the years of doing Hall of Fame uh, and seeing the amazing guests that come through and talk to you and all of these esteemed grads, and if they're a Hall of Famer, that means they have 10 years of working in the industry. And so it occurred to me that they have cool stories, but maybe less relevant information than you guys need. Like what you guys need to think about is like day one when you graduate aren't you curious about what that's going to look like what about like week one what about month one year one and so that was uh you know the the birth of this uh type of a presentation and so uh you know these guys uh are people that i keep in touch with uh and so actually i pulled up uh, i always like to pull up like the first email that i ever get from somebody hold on Oh no. And so actually, uh, Kyle and I didn't get super close when he was a student, and it wasn't until uh, COVID happened, and we were all sitting at home that, you know, Kyle started to get involved. And so there it is. Uh, you know, you can oh, take it no. away. Oh no. Yours is up on the screen over there. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And here's an early one from Issa. November 2018. And then uh, Mickey here. And uh, the first time that I ever met Mickey was on set. We were out in the parking lot in front of 4D. She was doing costumes. She was a volunteer. She had zero experience. And I yelled at her, like, first thing off the bat. Uh, I got a couple other cool Mickey things. So one time, uh, my really good friend and one of my mentors and one of the most prolific first ADs on the planet uh, named Dave Vengus came to visit the school. And uh, so there's, uh, and there's cousin, cousin Mitch in that picture, by the way, Stephen. <laughs> and then uh, some really uh, amazing grads in that photo. And then this, I think, is Hall of Fame 10. And uh, this guy here, Sam Florentino, is actually here now working on the crew. And, you know, it's like a who's who of amazing grads, Gabby Lima. And so anyway, um, you know, that's kind of like the, uh, the birth of, uh, of my relationship with these guys. But then we just kind of took it from there. So first of all, uh, you know, I'd like to talk to you guys about, you know, your time here as students, you know, so... Um, before you came here, did you know, think you knew what you wanted to do? I think so. What did you think before you came to sign up for Full Sail that you were going to do here? I, I just wanted to work on movie sets, and Full Sail was, you know, you come to Full Sail to do that. And once I got here, I realized it was much more than that, and that there was a lot more work, a lot of prep, Were you thinking a lot of like networking. Specific department getting, when you first got here? Like, I'm going to go to film school and I'm going to be a blank. Or did you, were you kind of open? I thought I was going to be in camera. That's not what happened. <laughs> That's not what happened. It, I, well, I think it is really interesting from my perspective to see you guys before you sign up and what you think <laughs> you're going to do. And then when you're here, you know, kind of how the target moves around a little bit. So how about you, Mickey? Did you have an idea before you came here about what you're going to do? Um, I think I thought I wanted to be a cinematographer, mostly because I think the word sounded cool in my head. <laughs> 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 um, but I really had no idea. 
I was just going for it. I thought it'd be cool to work in movies. Issa? Oh, I was 100% sure that I was going to be a director. I work in, I'm like, I'm directing every movie that is coming after I graduate. So what about, um, you know, by the time you graduated, then what did you think that you were going to do once you started working? I have, so, so when I, by the time that I graduate, I thought I was going to be um, a director of photography. And, and you, during your time here, you spent a lot of time with uh, Mo and doing camera stuff, and you did camera like every chance that you could get when you were studying here. Yeah, I realized pretty quick that directing was not my path, and I moved to camera, and I focused all 20 months on camera. What about you, Mickey? What, what did you, uh, you know, kind of specialize in when you were here? And then by the time you graduated, did you have a thought about where you thought you were going to go? Yeah, I mostly also focused on camera, grip stuff, thought it was cool. Um, I think I figured I'd start out as a set PA and just go up that route um, for a while, as most people do. But How about yeah. you? By the time that you graduated, did you have a, a thought about where you fit into all of this? Yeah, I think when I started, I wanted, definitely wanted to be in camera. Then I kind of focused on the grip stuff for a while, and I just wasn't that interesting to me personally. And then I focused on the AD right before COVID happened. Yeah, and I mean, I think that's a really important thing for you guys to understand. Like, you, the thing that you said you wanted to do when you were 18 and decided to come here, like, you don't have a lot of information to base that decision on. And so if you come here and you realize that you are interested in different things that you thought, you know, that's totally normal. And also, I don't think you need to leave here like as a specialist in one thing. I believe if you uh, have interest in different departments, uh, it kind of like gives you a, a, a broader base when you graduate to be able to uh, explore opportunities that you create for yourself pretty much. So um, let's talk about uh, where you went after you graduated. So uh, where did you uh, go after you graduated? So when I graduated, I was very anxious, as I'm sure everybody will be at some point. But I was anxious because I didn't do a lot here. I'm telling you this now, that you absolutely should be doing these sets, the, the APNs, the FI4s, like anything that you can get your hands on. Do it now, please, <laughs> um, just from experience, but when I graduated, I moved back up to New Hampshire, Boston area, and uh, I just felt defeated because I like didn't, I didn't, I, I wasted my time here. Um, I tried hustling during COVID, but the start of COVID, um, got on the staff me up, landed my first staff me up gig, which was Chopped up in Maine. That was pretty fun. Um, networked from there, met some New York people, and then just built the resume up. And then eventually I joined this um, Facebook group called Channel 14. It's a Boston PA network, the, the best, honestly. And I saw this gig. Um, they were looking for Gator PAs. Um, like they, have, I don't know what they call them, down here, but like those like little ATV go karts, they were looking for some PAs to drive them That's for fun. a Showtime show. Dexter, um, I almost didn't apply to it, um, but I did, and met all of the Boston ADs, PAs, like the, the core. Everybody that gets work was on that, and. So what, it just snowballed from there. What drove your decision? I mean, because these guys get towards the end of their time here, and it's, it's, uh, it's a pretty big decision where to move. Now, it's not that big of a decision, all right? Like traditional people that don't know about freelance film work, like they think picking a place to live is a huge decision. But I'm here to tell you we're not normal like that, okay? And so you can – pick a place and then move, you, you know, you don't have to stay there. So it's not really that big of a decision. So I want to take a little bit of the pressure off of you guys about picking where to live. And if you don't like it, you move again. Not a big deal. It doesn't mean anything. It's not a, you were defeated or whatever. It's just that you have that choice, that opportunity. So was it just that 
was it because you knew that there was industry up there or you just needed to go home? I or? had no idea that there was an industry up there. I guess there's a lot of Boston movies. But um, yeah, I didn't know that there was anything up there. I just came home defeated, just gonna save up some money, move to New York, because that was closest. And I just love being in the Northeast and I love my Dunkin' Donuts, so I can't. <laughs> can't leave that. So Mickey, what about you? Um, you know, how did you, you, so you ended up in Atlanta. Yeah. So what, uh, what drove that choice? Was it a hard choice? Um, the choice was made for me, which was nice. Um, I think I had the privilege of going to school during COVID. So I that, got What a privilege. <laughs> <laughs> I, most of my classes were online. So when I was not taking class online, I was just hanging out in 3F with these guys and it was approaching graduation and there was a grad, Sydney Saunders, um, in Atlanta, who's an office PA, and she was switching to another show. They needed somebody to fill her spot. Texted Larry. Larry let me know, and I, you know, just kind of shipped up to Atlanta and, and did it. But um, previous to that, were you kind of trying to think about it? Did you have a, yeah. any LA on your radar or yeah, other I, places? Yeah, I remember being stressed about it, trying to figure out if you go, you know, LA, Atlanta, the benefits of either of those places. Um, and ultimately, I ended up in Atlanta because I did get that first job. Um, but again, I don't, I don't know if it really matters where you start because you can always easily move. <clears throat> and so, um, so the first gig was an office PA gig. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, nobody, I think, when they first sign up at film school says, I'm going to film school because I want to be an office PA. <laughs> uh, you know, um, but it is a pretty cool entry point. And if you get the opportunity, uh, you should do it. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, we can't even really scratch the surface here of what the production office is. Okay, it's not SPO where people hang out and like make copies or whatever the heck you guys are doing in there. Uh, you know, the production office is really a, a hub and a super vibrant, important, amazing place. Uh, and you know, you get. Uh, you know, if you're working in there as an office PA, you get access to pre-production that you would not get as a set PA mm -hmm. because set PAs don't get prep. Office PAs are there. You see that, uh, you know, there's just no other way to see that part of it. So, um, you know, so not, not that office PA was like your target yeah. or even on your radar, but when you got the opportunity, of course, you said... I, I jumped on it. Yeah, <laughs> so I want to do that for sure. Yep. Cool. So uh, how about how about you? Um, so you were still thinking camera by the time you graduated, right? Yeah. Uh, and then where, so where did you end up uh, moving to? So right now I'm living in St. Pete, so still in Florida. Um, I wanted to move to LA and then COVID happened and I didn't. I went to Kentucky and I was in Louisville and I got a phone call to go to Atlanta. And I packed all my things, I went to Atlanta. And then after that job, I got another phone call to go to Tampa. So I packed all my things again and I went to Tampa. And I stayed there. That's cool. And so, um, I mean, did you end up doing camera stuff uh, like we all would have thought that you would kind of start out? Like, how did that evolve? So my first job after Full Sail was a feature film and I was second AC. And then I had the opportunity, thanks to COVID, we'll say, um, I did a feature film. Um, it was, or f we didn't have anything else to do, so we filmed the movie, we edited it, and I was uh, doing camera and I realized that I didn't enjoy it as I thought I would in real life. So I changed and now I work on production. Uh, you know, and so here, so you come, you think you know what you want to do before you come here. You learn what the things are and you find things that interest you. But the reality is we can't simulate here at the school what it is like to live that life in that department in a real scenario where it's not three 10 hour days, it's you know, 40, 18 hour days, and you really get to see what it's like. And you're allowed to change your mind. And that doesn't mean that you gave up on your dream or anything like that. It's just that you didn't have enough information and you can't until uh, you actually try it. So, you know, I can point to a dozen grads that 
uh, you know, started out doing the thing that we thought they were going to do and said, wow, that's what this is like. I don't like that. And uh, you're allowed to, to pivot and, and change. So, um, so how did you find, get these jobs? I mean, like, what, did you do good with networking while you were here? Have you gotten a lot of jobs through Full Sail Connections? Yes. So my first job, it was through a Full Sail instructor. He um, said my name, and he got me that job. And my second job, the one that actually um, got my career starting, um, it was a Full Sail student and Gabby Lima. She graduated six months before I did, and she didn't want to take that job, so I took it. And Everything went from there. It's, uh, that's awesome. So um, how about you? Job op creating opportunities. So, you know, obviously I talk to all of you guys about networking and about creating relationships. I mean, every time that you guys have me in a lecture, I spend like the first half hour ranting and raving and jumping up and down and telling you guys to do the right things and that, to make it worthwhile to be here and that it's not just like classes and labs and some people really struggle with that message that you have to reach out to people and you have to create relationships and you have to leave here with a list of people that you are talking to. And that's really hard for some people to digest because it's not, it, it's, un, it's awkward, it's uncomfortable to do that, you know? It's not natural and, it, it's, and if you're not comfortable with it, it, it feels impossible. Um, and so, even though I say that over and over again, I think some people are like, well, no, I'm just going to you know, hit send on a, 100 resumes and wait for the phone to ring. And you know, I don't think that's really how that works. So uh, you know, have your jobs come through, through, through relationships that you made? And, you yeah. know. Oh, absolutely. So yeah, I mean, so you got one on Staff Me Up, but then after that, it kind of went. Yeah, uh, it, it snowballed. Like, once you land your first gig, just network, try to learn everybody's names, everybody's faces, and just like, just get to know people. It's like, it's what I did on Dexter. I made best friends with the key PA, the background PA. I made friends with, I made friends with all of them. Yeah. And they still get me work. Like I was just texting with a couple of them the other day. And now you're getting work for uh, other grads that are, I mean, we have now, uh, you know, between uh, Doobie and Jenna Hobgood, we've got some cool grads that are doing good stuff in the Northeast, mm -hmm. in New England, and uh, they, they're plugged in now to that community and, uh, you know, willing to help out because it feels good to help out. And so another recent grad went up and had his first ever day on set thanks to this guy that, uh, that got him, him hired on it. And so, uh, so you got the office PA gig, which is, wasn't even on your radar, and nobody comes to film school to be an office PA, but... I don't know if you guys know this, but my first gig in L.A. was as an office PA. Not even on my radar, not even anything that I had even heard of. And I think, you know, having a broad base and being interested in different things and having uh, a, a network of people that are looking out for you that are going to provide you opportunities when somebody says, do you want to be an office PA, even if you don't, uh, you want to say yes to that. Um, I think, and I think these guys would agree, like, especially when you're first starting out, trying to navigate, like, forget about it. Like, don't try to have a tiny little target. You want to have the biggest target that you can. So you want to be able to say yes to whatever. And so even though, uh, you know, Mickey might not have wanted to be an office PA, and neither did I, I was the first one every single day. Uh, I took notes and wrote things down. Uh, you know, I... Um, looked nice and smelled nice and paid attention and was in the right place at the right time. And at the end of it, they said, you're the best office PA that we ever had. And I was like, really? And they're like, do you want to come work on the next thing as an office PA? And so I think it's your job. If you say yes, if you get an opportunity, whether it's craft service assistant or location PA or whatever, at the end of that, they should look at you and say, wow, you're the best whatever we've ever had even if you hate it and you don't you, you know it's you know you're never ever going to do it again and so uh your gig as an office pa the thing that you weren't even that interested in you know that's what happened right yeah. it led to more office pa work yeah. and you you did want to check out 
set. You were like a, a you know, a set uh, bulldog when you were here, like all the time yeah. on every single set. And being in the office, you are removed from that. And that is kind of a bummer about Office PA, that you're not on set. Yeah. So uh, what, it, what happened after Strays? Um, so I went from Father by the Strays. That same team brought me on. Um, oh, so Cindy got you Father of the Bride. Yep. Right. And then both of you guys were on Strays. On Strays. Right, right, right. Yep. Um, and on Strays, I really made an effort to still visit sets. So in the office, as an office PA, a lot of times you'll rap, um, and they're still shooting. And so I would pop pop over to set and hang out, not paid, um, just networking with people. Don't, I, you don't just gloss over that. That <laughs> is, I mean, all the other office PAs are like, Arr! I'm going home. <laughs> I've been at work for 10 hours. Yep. I've been answering phones. I'm going home. And, you know, like, what, what is the formula for success? Like, after she was done at the office on her own, mm -hmm. she still went to the set to hang out. And people notice stuff like that. Were any of the other office PAs there? No. Um, How do you set yourself apart? Set yourself apart. Do stuff that other people aren't doing. Yeah, it was a great way to meet people. Um, and then another full sale grad, Mike Simmons, offered me um, we called it Buzz Cup, but it was Werewolf by Night. And I was so excited to work with Mike Simmons. I had networked with him when I was a student. Um, so I jumped into another office PA gig with that. Um, and by that point, I just wanted to, wanted to go to set. I wanted to try out set. I wanted to get out of the office. Didn't think I wanted to do the office anymore. Um, and then I was offered uh, a Francis Ford Coppola movie. Um, and I talked to Larry about it. <laughs> Because obviously I didn't want to office PA. I wanted to try and move on. And Larry was like, this is a once in a lifetime thing. Just do it. Just be there. It's good so advice. Had wonderful advice. Yeah. Had a great time. Met great people. So, um, you know, that, that is kind of how, that, how it works. You know, you're going to create opportunities through people that you meet. All of those opportunities came from people that Mickey had met. And you get an opportunity and maybe you're like looking at this door to open, but it's this one in the corner of your eye that pops open and you run through it, knock the freaking hinges off, whatever, and you go in it. And at the end, your job is for them to say, wow, you're the best blah, blah, blah we've ever had. And they're going to say, do you want to come work on the next day? And you now have a clearer picture of what, where that goes. And you can make a decision to, maybe you're not doing anything anyway, and you got no other prospects, and so then it's an easy decision. Or you liked the work, and you enjoyed going to work every day, and the people there valued you, and you look forward to going to work. And guys, that is called success. Like if you wake up in the morning and you're excited to go to work, you are successful because most people don't have that. And so don't turn your back on it because of something that you thought you wanted to do. All of a sudden, you're on a path. And so then, uh, you know, you take the next gig, and now it's like you're kind of slowly climbing up this ladder. And every rung, you get a little higher above the clouds, and you can see where it goes to. And so, uh, you know, Mickey might... Uh, after those other movies said, okay, I'm ready to jump off this ladder and like start over again somewhere else. But you know, when you get an opportunity like that, uh, for me, I make decisions not like what's the quickest route or what's the most money. Okay, I don't make decisions based on that. I make decisions based on what are what's going to be cool experiences. You know, that when someday, many years from now, you know, I'm on my deathbed and my life is racing before my eyes like I don't want to think about the the bank account like I'm going to think about these experiences they're going to be good stories to share with you guys that's how I make uh, choices and so you know it was fun to talk it out with Mickey and and say like you know okay this might be another year mm -hmm. okay that is going in a different direction maybe not necessarily where you want to go but I don't think that that's a waste of time and maybe you're not you know, it's not as direct, but, you know, the stories that you have, yeah. and we'll get to later what you're doing now, but, I mean, you know, you're never going to regret, I don't think, no. you know, uh, doing it, uh, but, you know, maybe you are going to want to bust out of the office and try some other stuff. <laughs> One day. Right. So, um, Issa, you ended up, you know, 
from those experiences in narrative when you graduated and even making, um, and I mean, a good movie actually that they made during COVID, just like two or three people and uh, Full Sail, uh, if you go back uh, on the Instagram, you know, a couple of years, they posted about it. And we were all very proud of this movie and it went into some film festivals. And um, it's available for you guys to watch it. Um, it's on Tubi and um, Amazon Prime and Apple TV. And so, uh, you know, like to actually make something and it turned out pretty good, uh, that's awesome. But, you know, but now you're in unscripted. Now you're in yeah. reality. Like, n that wasn't even a conversation. No. So how in the world did you end up going down that road? So I never considered reality. That was not on my um, plan of life. But after, like, during COVID, everything was shut down. And reality, they were still doing things. So I took the job. And I happened that I loved it. It's so different to what I learned. But at the same time, it's the same. And... Yeah, I, that's when I find out I like production, I enjoy all those things that I didn't like when I was unscripted, and yeah. That's cool, so I mean, you actually ex got experience with camera and really got to see what it was and decide to make a pivot, and then this opportunity presented itself. How did you get the first opportunity in reality? Um, <clears throat> was it through Gabby? Yeah, Gabby called me. I was doing a job that I hated. I was crying outside that day. Somebody yelled at me and I was miserable. And she said, I need you here tomorrow. Um, you're gonna have to quarantine for two weeks before we start filming. And I say, yes, I packed all my things. I quit my job that same day um, <coughs> and I moved. I was like, I don't wanna be in Kentucky anymore. I'm gonna be um, in this, um, it was a hotel, so they gave us like place to sleep and everything. And my family was like, what are you gonna do after? I'm like, I'll figure out after. I know that I have two months in a hotel and I'm gonna be doing what I wanna do. So I was peeing in um, Florida, I'm sure. And was it, um, is that, did it just kind of snowball from there that where you are now, people you've met on different shows in reality and just kind of moving through yeah. with the people that you meet? So in that show, um, we were maybe 30 BAs, and after we finished that show, they started filming another one, and I went to that other one, so I keep traveling with them. When that show ended, somebody that I knew from the first uh, Floribama, they had an opportunity, but they were doing something else, and they offered me that job. There's a the one in Tampa, Tampa Bay's, and I moved to Tampa, to St. Pete for that. Um, same reality TV, and from there, yeah, you just meet people, every day you do your best, and they will call you back. Is, is Tampa your, your home base now? I mean... Yeah. And you think, like, permanently, or are you going to be moving around as other opportunities present themselves? So, how it works for me, I'm not, I'm never working in Tampa, I just go there for vacations, <laughs> um, but I travel for work, I'm <clears throat> just... I was here in Orlando filming, we just finished. Um, before that, I was in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, only this year, last year, California, New Orleans. It's been fun. You like traveling around like that? I have to love it. <laughs> yeah, I like it too, it's cool. Living in a hotel uh, for a long time is kind of a bummer, but um, you know, short, short stints in hotels is pretty exciting and cool. Yeah. She's trashing the room like a rock star. <laughs> cool. But yeah, that's how that works, guys. You know, the, so the, your Full Sail family, and it's great to network outside of that as well, but I bang my head against the wall sometimes that you guys are not, while you're here, just mostly doing Full Sail stuff. Get on our sets where our teachers are there. It's great that there's stuff happening outside in Orlando and that you have opportunities to do stuff in other places on campus or uh, even for production companies outside. You know, great, but I think in the short time that you're here, you should really, you have your whole life to do stuff that's not here. But while you're here, you know, take advantage of it as much as you can. And the same with networking and making connections. Like, Sometimes you guys are like so hard not trying to look at what's in front of you. You're like, oh, I can make connections over there and over there. And it's like you have this, this whole pool that's right in front of you. And that, to me, is what you've got to really 
focus on while you're here. And that, and that is what cracks the door open. Okay, I can't hire you guys from my desk in 3F, but I can crack the door open. You know, and other grads do that, and now these guys are doing that. For they're all, You guys have all hired uh, grads now that have come up behind you. And so you get the door cracked open for you, and, you know, through seeds that you have planted in your, like, Full Sail Networking Garden. And then on every new show, you add seeds into that garden, people that you met. And it's probably going to be somebody that you meet on that show or somebody that you know previously that's going to get you your next show. And on the next show, you're going to make more connections and plant them in the garden. And it kind of grows from there. So, you know, just recognize that's how it works and stop trying to avoid it or find think of try to think of another way where you don't have to network with full sale people because really uh you know that's the that's the real value of it i think so uh you stayed mostly up there in the northeast have you done any traveling around uh, i did one traveling job that was kind of uh, actually a couple i did one down here uh 2021 i think it was um, the inspiration for SpaceX launch, that was kind of cool. And then I did my second gig ever, it was also on Staff Me Up. Uh, it was this job in Rhode Island, it was called Deer. It was like a documentary kind of reality of just, um, uh, they had famous people, of course, and then they had uh, people writing, like just casual people write letters to the famous people and then they had like the people react to the letters and so they were up there doing the letter writers um i got to travel with them i wasn't originally supposed to um all the other pas on that weren't that great no offense to any of them but they they asked me to to go to new york and <coughs> pittsburgh pennsylvania and it was great i said yes i i think that's um another thing that you guys got to be aware of is that there's a lot of not great people that have jobs. Uh, it's not always merit-based getting hired. It's you know relationship-based or nepotism-based sometimes. And so, uh, once you when you guys are on a professional set, uh, don't think that just because there's somebody there that has more experience than than you that they're good or that you can't easily be better than them by just doing the intangible things that we talk about all the time. You and you're like. I can't believe all I got to do is show up early and I'm going to be the best one. And I swear, like, sometimes that's it. Oh, I want to ask you guys. Um, so I always, uh, you know, advice I got when I was first starting out about keeping a little notepad and always writing things down. And, uh, you know, I, I started doing it and I saw, I noticed that the person that I was talking to, like, they kind of even visceral change in the way that they were receiving me just because of this stupid gesture of like writing down what they said and it really like made a difference to me and so I have perpetuated that advice uh, to all of you and everybody all the time so is it still good advice have you do you do it and uh, is it, it would you would you say that I can continue giving that advice as a easy way to set yourself apart yes yeah yeah, yeah absolutely <laughs> oh my gosh okay good uh, I want to make sure I'm not just giving like old man advice, like <laughs> use this camera and everything will be fine. Okay, good. So, you know, uh, there are few ways that you could set yourself apart, like your first day on set when you don't know anything, uh, when you're exp everything that you're experiencing on like a second by second basis is the first time that you've ever seen it. So I want, you know, you guys should think about that, like really kind of play that out in your head your first day on set. Uh, I, I love seeing you guys with your eyeballs like this big, like, wow, all this stuff, all these old people yelling at each other. This is crazy. And so, uh, you know, there are, uh, you're, you're, you're not going to do something like skills based that day that's going to make people go, wow, day one person, you sure are a superstar. And so, uh, you know, there are little things that you can do. And believe it or not, the notepad uh, is a good one. You know, you just whip that thing out when people start talking to you and you're going to see um, like a difference. So uh, what was your first kind of like big narrative uh, opportunity, you know, uh, big summer blockbuster, eat some popcorn, blow some stuff up kind of situation? I think mine was 
probably Black Panther. Uh, they were up in Boston doing the Boston chase scene in that movie. It was, uh, it was really hard. It was a really hard job. Um, I was their walk EPA, and I learned a lot of things. <laughs> and KP was the second AD, right? Was it? Uh, yeah. You were working with somebody that. I uh, remember. Crystal. Oh, Crystal, right? Yeah. Munson, yeah. Yes, Crystal. There, I have a, a couple of friends of mine who are still like the biggest second ads, like in the you know planet probably, and uh, you know they they call me when they hire full sale grads, and uh, you know it's. It, it's cool for me to kind of live it uh, through them. And so was that your biggest walkie PA gig to that point? Oh, easily. Um, I had 350 walkies on that starting. Um, I got no prep time to do. Oof. Um, I had like 12 hours, which is not a lot for 350. That's also to distro them all out to the crew. Um, day of. Turns out, like, 50 of the walkies are on a different frequency, so they can't talk to each other. So we had to order 50 more, and I'm prepping them in the streets of Cambridge, just giving them out to all the picture cars and precision drivers. So it was uh, Were they, I mean, and I, and that's that's a, That's got to be stressful. It's not your fault Ish, at all. No. I got, but people need weird. their radios, and they're standing there, and poor Kyle. Like, so... You know, um, I think we talked about how to get ready to be the walk EPA, and did uh, did you connect with any full sale grads that had done it before that could help you? Uh, you know, give you some insight information before you did it. Uh, I did. Um, I also talked to a lot of Boston walk EPAs too, like some of my closest friends. Uh, Drawing a blank on who I talked to from full. Was it Sale. Brandon Townsley? Maybe? Oh, it was Brandon. Yeah. yeah, it was Brandon. It was Brandon. Yeah, Brandon Townsley. And uh, you know, walkie PA for set PA is a entry point too, and it but it's stressful, and you are responsible for thousands and thousands of dollars of equipment. It is a thankless job. It is, yeah. Very and thankless. so uh, you know, I I hope you guys would have the instinct. And again, use your full sale family. You get an opportunity. You find another full sale grad that did that thing before and ask them so that when you show up on day one, you look smart because you look experienced because you talked to somebody that, that went through it. So, um, you know, all of these guys were majorly affected in their first years by COVID, like, uh, it was a uh, obviously. You guys remember three years ago? Anyway, uh, imagine like trying to graduate and start to start doing this during that time, and so it was a major, you know, kind of uh, of a factor. And so, you know, when I would do zooms and stuff in 2020 with students, I was like, do not be a victim about this and say, oh, my career stinks because of COVID. Uh, it, it doesn't have to, you know, you're always, everyone's going to have curveballs. You're going to have, uh, you know, these things, these struggles, and, you know, you just got to keep plugging away and moving forward and don't be, get butt hurt about it or be a victim and say, oh, I, it's out of my control because these things are happening. These guys all got through that. Uh, you know, we, I hope that you guys are paying attention to the trades and the new entertainment industry news because there could be another major you know, situation here coming up with the writer strike that was authorized uh, the day before yesterday. And so, uh, you know, that could absolutely affect the start of your guys' career and these guys' next, uh, you know, chapter uh, of what's happening next. So, um, so year one, uh, did you survive just doing film stuff or did you have to, you know, uh, find outside ways to support yourself? Um, no, I survived. I made it. I did spend the first probably six to eight months couch surfing. Um, I had on graduation days when I kind of got the call to do this office PA job. So that night I was driving to Atlanta. I didn't tell the coordinator that I wasn't in Atlanta. I was like, no, I'll be there in the morning to, to COVID test to get, get in the office. Um, so I was like calling people on my way to Atlanta at like two in the morning trying to find a place to couch surf. Um, 
but made it through, figured it out. But so. yeah, I mean, you know, like nobody wants to, I mean, you know, if you're friends that have like regular college and are going to get jobs, they're not going to couch surf, uh, you know, but that's, there's a price for having a really cool job. And the price is it's hard to start. And so uh, you got to be willing to do that. And, you know, it's, uh, if it's full sale people and, you know, a part of our family, then uh, they understand, you know, and they'll let you crash on their couch. And if that's what you got to do to get it going, then uh, that's what you got to do. Did you ever have to take uh, outside jobs to, to keep it going, like survival job? Yeah, I was a waitress, terrible waitress, by the way. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Um, but when there was like in the when everything was closed and um, we were doing like takeouts, and when I started working, um, it's hard sometimes. Like sometimes you're gonna have good times and sometimes it's just not work. And after I actually started working, then I didn't took any other jobs, um, just because um, I want to be available and put all my attention on my next work in, job in the industry. So yeah, I took that one and then that was it. And um, so how, like, what about uh, unemployment of, in film? Like your first year, like were you 100% employed, like 50%, like did you get a job and then have a big break? And then how many like big breaks did you have in between gigs? Um, even now, I'm gonna say in my first year, I worked probably four months of the year. Now, we make a lot of money. Like, our job is different than any other job for the amount of hours, so you have to be smart with your money and prepare yourself for those months that you're not gonna be working. Um, right now, I worked eight to 10 months of the year, and I have two months that I know that I'm not gonna have any income, and I have to be ready for rent and all the utilities so yeah that's my biggest advice uh be it smart with your money when you're making money what about uh your level of employment in year one how many months do you think and what about uh periods of unemployment during that um i, I worked pretty consistently but there is always that kind of unknown when you're finishing a show of how long am i gonna have to go without making any money before i get another offer um but as an office pa you're pretty much staffed, so you know that you're gonna be working until this date, and you have that amount of time to try and find another show to jump on. But I did spend, between shows, like a month, two months. You guys so. need to be prepared, and your families need to understand that, that your family that doesn't work in film production, that are contractors and lawyers and whatever your parents do, that is not this. They have to understand if you have three months of unemployment that it doesn't mean you did anything wrong or that is a sign that things aren't going well. This is cyclical. You will have periods of unemployment. Here are three uh, recent grads that are kicking like more butt than 99% of our grads. And you just heard them talk about periods of unemployment. So you're going to have that and you better be ready for it, and your family better be prepared for, uh, to know that it's okay. Like, it's part of this. So what about you? Um, you know, amount of work versus periods of unemployment, and then did you have to take jobs to supplement your oh, film Oh, career? definitely. Um, I probably stay up in Boston, I'm working probably nine, 10 months out of the year, which is pretty good. It's usually the winter up there that slows down because nobody really likes to be outside. <laughs> so I usually take it off and ski a bunch. I just turn into a ski bum. But yeah, um, I think the longest break I had was maybe two, two and a half months. Um, so you think you're not gonna have yeah. that? Like, you are. You definitely have it. it. So what about uh, supplemental income? Have you had to? Yeah, of course. Uh, I just help out at like a family restaurant in my town. And on top of that, I do Uber Eats. Which, um, it's all right, but you gotta do what you gotta do to survive. There's no judgment at all in taking another job. Like the Boston PAs usually make $15 an hour. So it's like, you're gonna have to take something else. So, you know, again, like just, you, you have to understand that. And 
the more grads that you talk to, you're going to hear the same thing over and over again. That's the point of this. That's the point of you talking to grads, of you knowing what to expect. So you're not surprised. So you know that this is part of it. And, uh, you know, I would just point out, um, don't wait until the show is over to try to drum up some other gigs that you got to do it while you're still working. So you're super busy, you're super tired, there's three weeks left on your show, but that's when you gotta start reaching out to people. And as a matter of fact, you know, um, I talk a lot about um, people's perception of you and optics, <clears throat> and even uh, you being aware of that, you being aware of how you sound, you being aware of your posture when you're talking to people, and your body language, and making eye contact, eye contact and all that stuff. But it even comes across in tone of your voice. It even comes across in text tone. And so for you to reach out to somebody while you're busy and working, hey, what's up? Haven't talked to you in a while. This show is so crazy. I'm having so much fun. We got like three weeks left. Is it cool if we grab coffee when I'm done? Okay, got to go. Bye. Okay, you understand like you sound busy. You sound like you got stuff going on. Uh, you know, and so uh, it's, a, it's more of a appealing tone in, in your outreach as opposed to, hey, my show ended two weeks ago. Can you please buy me some coffee? I got nothing going on. Have you heard anything? You understand, like, uh, it's, there's just a natural attraction to somebody that's got stuff going on. Like, I want to be in business with the person that's got stuff going on, not the person that I'm their only lifeline and I got to do everything. You understand? And so sometimes even reach out and fake like you're busy. I'm okay with that. All right. It's a little, uh, I don't know. I don't think it's like manipulative or sneaky. It's just like playing the game. And so uh, just be aware that when you reach out to people, it's like, uh, you know, people want to be in business when you got stuff going on. So uh, let's talk about you know, what's going on now, man? What's next? What's going on? What are you up to? Uh, just right now, I'm kind of keeping it low-key. There's a couple of, like, non-DGA, low-budget stuff that I'm going to jump on when I'm back home. Um, it sounds like they're having some budget problems, so I think I maybe have another week or two weeks to well, hang out, relax. Scrape together the shekels. Yeah, yeah the shekels. <laughs> um, and then there's some bigger stuff coming in later this summer that I'm hoping to chop on. And so do you think you're on uh, AD path? Is that where yeah, you're headed towards? I think so. Okay, cool. Awesome. Uh, any uh, outrageous pinch yourself story that you want to share with us? Anything that happened uh, so far that <laughs> you got to like be, I can't believe that this is my job. I, uh, I haven't told you this one, but I got chased by a black bear <laughs> on Salem's lot. <laughs> That poor bear. They didn't break for lunch at all on Salem's Lot. And it was like the one day I was on main unit, uh, I was helping the lunch PA, Benson, run back and forth lunches through the woods. It's like this, um, it's like crew parking, the catering, this trail, and then it's like the last scene of the movie. It's like this... Um, uh, drive-in theater so I'm like running these lunches full of food up to the drive-in and I look behind me and there's a black bear just starting to run at me <laughs> I'm trying to fumble for my walk <laughs> I'm trying to fumble call, for man? my surveillance Who are you calling? The <laughs> just Locations. saying breaker breaker uh, there's a black bear on set we had kids one of the other PAs was able to do it and all of a sudden one of the second second ADs his name is Turo it's like big short burly man goatee he just comes running I've never seen him run so fast he runs down the path he's like doobie where's the bear and I'm just like Turo we ran up the set <laughs> they're like okay get the kids inside <laughs> we're doing a lockdown <laughs> dude absolutely like that was probably the most crazy thing that has happened never have I ever <laughs> It's a new one for me. I, I saw him a couple of weeks ago. And the bear? On the, no, okay. no, the, the AD, the AD. Um, and he was telling me, he's like, that's still the craziest thing. That's amazing, man. <laughs> so what have you been up to? Anything uh, cool happening for you? I don't think so. <laughs> Nothing? Um, no, I, towards the end of uh, Megalopolis, um, I got offered to be Francis's assistant. Francis who? Uh, Mr. Coppola, so I 
I took it. That was a whole. whole <laughs> So still figuring that out. I'm only a couple weeks into into that. We're in post now, so it's just. I mean, uh, it's it's crazy that you graduated two years ago and currently you are Francis Ford Coppola's assistant. I just think that's yeah. pretty cool. <laughs> and so uh, you, they dragged you back in. They dragged me back in. <laughs> it's a Godfather thing. To uh, office PA, and you did it. Maybe you would have if it was a different opportunity. You would have gone a different direction and said no. And so what, where, are you, where are you pointed right now? Like, where do you think you're gonna end up if you had to guess now? I, I don't know. And I think that's very exciting. It is. Um, yeah, I'll, I guess, keep on with this assistant job for as long as it lasts um, and then figure it out from there. Um, I had the benefit of being able to kind of intern and day play as a grip and as a set PA on Megalopolis. I made connections and um, told those, those guys that was interested in what they do. So, um, yeah, once this is over, I guess we'll figure it out and go from there. <laughs> Crazy. What about you, Issa? What have you been up to now? Um, right now, I'm coordinating for Jersey Shore Family Vacation. And I think the whole show is the craziest thing that has happened to me. <laughs> um, it's been amazing and crazy, rewarding. Snooki is your friend now. <laughs> And Polly D. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I feel I do love reality more than what I thought I could ever. So I'm definitely going to stay on reality. Um, I don't know exactly if I'm going to stay in production, if I might go to the producer side of it. But, yeah. That's so cool. I love it. Okay, good. Um, so I think we can open for any questions. Anybody has any? Got one in the front. Hey, Jacob, what's up, buddy? You're going to get a microphone. Come down. Thank you. Good morning. So on your time on set when getting yelled at, would you say the best way to get through it is don't see it as like crit as spite or they hate you. See it more as criticism and constructive feedback. And I know they, because they care for you and your safety and, you know, thick skin and stuff. Yeah, so yeah, what about getting yelled at by old people? How does that feel? Uh, it sucks. It's going to happen. Larry told me that I'm going to get yelled at. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to F up. And it has happened. It's happened multiple times. But you literally just have to brush it off and just say that you'll never do it again. Um, it's over pretty quick. Yeah. It just just like, gotta, you got to just, like, it sucks. It sucks a lot, and you just can't take it to heart, and it's probably not you. They're probably just having a bad day. Just, just brush it off. It's not worth it. I, I tested, I showed you early on what it was like, <laughs> yeah. and I yelled at uh, Mickey for not having uh, double stick tape or a roller or something, Yeah. or a safety pin maybe. That just was go it. copy that, sorry, yep. you know. So have you, have you gotten, have you been yelled at uh, in the real world? Oh yeah. Uh, by Mike Simmons, <laughs> probably. Um, no, you, you just move on. Usually it's a stressful moment and you either miss something, didn't do something, or something out of your, your hands and stuff happens and you move on and figure it out and... You know, like, yeah. uh, <laughs> stuff, uh, goes downhill and, uh, you know, so maybe the person that yelled at you got yelled at the person, by the person that was above them and it just kind of trickles down and then you yell at your cat or something, I guess, because <laughs> that's all you got. Have you been, uh, nobody would yell at you. you oh, say, I get yelled at you. Oh, how could this happen? <laughs> but um, it's what you're saying. We work in a pretty stressful um, environment. There are a lot of days without sleeping. We can go three months where you're getting five hours sleep. So people that yell at you, they forget about that in the second that they turn around. So just keep doing your job, do the best you can, and don't get back to them because you're going to lose that fight. Right, yeah, don't come over to me like eight hours later and be like, hey, remember when you yelled at me eight hours ago? Yeah, don't do that. And I'll be like, uh, no, but now I remember. <laughs> and, you know, like, there's a expression, um, a cool AD taught me not that long ago on the one and only Ivan, this guy, Andrew Stahl, who's now a first AD, and you know Stahl, right? I know Stahl. And, he, and yeah, he, he hired uh, Dion on Top Gun, and uh, Stahl taught me about a storm in a teacup. Okay, so you just got yelled at. And in your little world, 
It is the most, it's the worst thing. And you're like, oh, everybody thinks I'm an idiot. They're never going to hire me again. I got to go and straighten that out. But you got to like zoom out because in the big picture of what's going on, it's a storm in a teacup what happened to you. It's not even on anybody else's radar. Good answers, you guys. That was really good. But uh, good, important for you guys to know, even if you're great and you do everything right and you, uh, you know, are super professional and good attitude and network and everything, you are still going to get yelled at. So buckle up and get ready for it. It's not that bad. Nikki, got another one up front. Do we have any uh, online uh, questions by any chance? Okay, we got one from social. Okay, cool. Yes, so we have in the chat from Andres de Jesus, which... He graduated from, uh, with a film in B, uh, BS in film. So the question is for Mickey. How did being an office PA actually prepare you to be Francis Coppola's uh, personal assistant for Megalopolis? Um, very well. As, as an office PA, um, you're kind of handling all departments. Everything comes to the office and we distribute information, everything like that. So. Um, I got really good at communicating and knowing who to talk to and who to go to for answers. Um, so now that we're in post and my focus is really only one person and figuring out how to handle um, everything on his end, it's almost easier because I'm not dealing with a ton of departments. Um, and also learning how to use spreadsheets and printers and Wi-Fi and all that stuff is very helpful. But yeah. How's Francis with the printers and computers and stuff. He's very tech savvy. Oh, he is? Okay. Yeah. He's Sometimes the old guys, uh, you know, they can't figure that stuff out. We got to help them out. <laughs> um, cool. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. And another one for Larry. Uh, this is Elgin, who graduated with uh, film as well. He wanted to know, during that employment period or unemployment period, what do you recommend we do to improve ourselves if we haven't already been called for anything longer than usual? Uh, you know, just, I mean, networking is a f real full-time job. Like, you should be every day, especially if you're not working, you should be researching people, reaching out to people, uh, you know, um, to the seed planting analogy. Like, <clears throat> excuse me, if you want to plant a garden, you don't just play, plant one seed. You got to plant hundreds of them. You understand? And uh, the way that seeds work uh, even if you water them and give them sunlight, you put two right next to each other and give them exactly the same attention, maybe one will grow and one will not grow. And it's not that you did anything wrong. It's just that that's how seeds work. And so it's the same with networking. You really got to uh, – you can't reach out to too many different people. So, you know, um, uh, you spend your time networking. There are ways to get on set, uh, you know, even work as an extra – uh, is a way to get on set. You know, if you're not working, uh, it's really mindless and boring and horrible, but you are immersed in this world. You are uh, at least thinking about this, uh, you know, all the time. So, you know, there are ways that you can uh, keep yourself engaged uh, and keep yourself busy during those periods of unemployment, which are unfortunately, inevitably part of uh, this gig uh, economy that we have. Am I right? You're right. Camera right? You're right. Oh, yeah. All the way over there? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hi. So do any of you have the plan to get into the union, or do you know something about that process? Uh, about getting into unions. So the local union in Boston, or New England, is 481. Um, that covers set deck, crafty, uh, grips, and one other department. I just I can't think off the top of my head. But um, you just need thirty. You need thirty days typically. Um, you save the call sheets, and I think that's how you submit them. I could be wrong, but it's. I think it's thirty. 30 days and whatever department. You're, you're aiming towards uh, DGA, though, yeah. right? Yeah. So, you know, if he wants to AD on, I mean, you know, the narrative projects that we're talking about on set, everybody's in the union except for the PAs, pretty much. And so, you know, if you want to work on those larger projects, 
then you should start looking into unions and don't wait and or think that uh, you're going to get it in some class at full sale someday. You may or may not, but if it's you know your future and you're driving, then you could find out stuff about it now and you could be talking to grads about it now that are a little bit further down the road than these guys that would have all the information about that. I'm doing a panel later today about the DGA right back in this room at four o'clock uh, with two grads who are in union and both of them got in really different ways. So uh, if you're around, come check that out. Uh, but short of that, like there are grads that you can talk to that can give you information about that. You see yourself uh, unionizing at some point? I think so. Um, in Georgia, it's 161 for the office um, and I think 479 for all the craft people. So not sure what avenue I'm going to take yet in that sense, but I'm sure one day I'll probably apply. <laughs> have you started to familiarize yourself with, you know, what you have to do and all that stuff? Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah, 161 and 479 I don't think are, are too difficult. Obviously, DJ's a lot harder to get into, um, and there are varying degrees of, you know, price to get in. I think 600, which is cameras, you know, more expensive than say 479. But. Yeah, there's thousands of dollars of, uh, you know, fees that you have to pay, you know, initiation fees and stuff like that. You can, uh, you can, um, you know, spread it out over time, make mm -hmm. payments and stuff like that. But how about you? Is there, are there unions in reality and uh, is, are you going to need to get in? Yeah, there is a union for production. Um, it, go, it covers um, assistant production coordinators and coordinators. I got my days. Um, you need 100 days paid um, on the position that you're going to apply for or 10, I think 10 days in a uh, union show on that position. Um, I don't think I'm going to join it, to be honest. It's a lot of, like, the feeds are pretty high and I'm just comfortable how I am right now. I do work study and, yeah. I don't know. Maybe I someday you, you could, if, Next if there was a reason why, you would yeah. think about it. Hi. For Mickey, um, I've seen that you were a work study here, and from Buck's words, <laughs> the best work study. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was just wondering, like, if doing the stuff in SPO, like the scheduling receipts or whatever it is mm -hmm. that they had you doing, because I just became a work study, if that helped you as a production PA on an actual set. Um, it did. Okay. Yeah. Um, Mr. Chris Geary may have you do receipts. You will be doing that as an office PA every day. Um, yeah, learning how to do receipts, learning how to figure out the printer when the printer is just not, not doing its thing. Um, did we do a printer uh, session before did. you left? Yeah. yeah. Um, I got to do more of those, you know, like uh, where I'll, uh, you, you guys got to be comfortable with these printers and yeah. they do weird things and they're infuriating. Um, yeah, talk to Larry about how to answer phones. I did teach her what a phone was with a, with a <laughs> wire on it. I was like, this has a wire. Yeah. <laughs> There's a dial tone. Do you guys know what a dial tone is? Anybody? No. Some of you might not have ever heard one, you know? Yeah, knowing how to transfer people and not freak out when, you know, your top actor calls the production office and they want to talk to somebody and you're like, oh, how do I transfer the, the call? <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, also making spreadsheets and tracking things, mocking things is office PA bread and butter so yeah you guys can't get tripped up by technology like you should be able to join any network or troubleshoot why you can't join a network you should be able to troubleshoot uh, any model of printer or copier like that cannot trip you up when you first start out that those are not film school skills that's just like kind of problem-solving skills so uh, unfortunately guys uh, we have run out of time but I want to say Thank you so much to Kyle Duby, Mickey Potter, Isabel Machado. I, I love uh, hearing from you guys and getting updates. I'm so proud of you guys. Uh, you know, I'm so fulfilled and uh, it just brings me so much joy to share in all of your success. So congratulations. Keep up the great work and thank you so much.